What's up guys, Stefan here from App Stuff. Welcome back to the channel. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hope you guys are doing well. In this tutorial, we're gonna be learning how to build this awesome cryptocurrency app that you see here in front of me. Now, this is a lot more than just a cool user interface. This is actually displaying real-time crypto data with information that we're gonna be fetching from an API. So take a look at the app really quick. We have this awesome horizontally scrollable list of the top moving coins at the moment. And then we have this vertically scrollable list of the rest of our coins organized by market cap rank. So like I said, we're gonna be fetching all this information from an API, building the user interface from scratch. And it also has dark mode support, which makes this even more awesome. So without further ado, let's go ahead and get started by opening up Xcode and getting started with the code, guys. All right, boys and girls, with Xcode opened up, we are gonna go ahead and select app with iOS as the platform. We're gonna hit next, and I'm gonna call this Swift Coin Tutorial. And make sure you have Swift UI selected as your interface and Swift as your language. And let's go ahead and hit next and create our project. And to get started, let me go ahead and start by making the font way bigger for you guys. So I'm gonna go to preferences and then go to presentation large dark. So that should be uh, good enough for you guys to see now. Um, what I wanna start with guys is setting up our project directory. So we are gonna go over to the left here and we're gonna create some folders for our application just to keep everything organized. So let's go ahead and create five groups. And to do that, you can right click on the folder there and hit new group, or you can do what I did at first, which is the shortcut, which is hitting command, option, and N, right? So like I said, we're gonna create five of these guys. And the first one is going to be called utils. The second one is going to be for extensions. The third one is gonna be for our models. And let me see what else we got. Um, the fourth one is going to be called core. And the fifth one is going to be called app. So really quickly, let's just go ahead and move this app file uh, into the app folder, right? That makes sense. And then we are gonna to go to our core folder and we're actually gonna create another folder within that folder. So go select new group and we're gonna call this home. So I've recently started using this folder structure more um, as opposed to organizing everything by like model view view model. I like to organize things by feature now. Right, so everything that's associated with this home view is gonna go in this home folder. And the benefits of this folder structure are that when your app starts to get large and contain a lot of features, which eventually this app will, um, it's gonna be easier to navigate through things if you can just work on everything associated with one feature inside of this one folder, instead of having to go back and forth between a bunch of different things. So that's uh, what we're gonna do to start. Now, what I want us to do, uh, to do is actually replace this content view. We're not gonna be using that. So in order to do that, first we're gonna delete it. And then we are gonna to go to our home folder and create two more folders. One is gonna be for views and the other is going to be for view models. And we're gonna create our own home view here. So I'm gonna call this, uh, it's gonna be a Swift UI view and it's just gonna be called home view. Now let's go back to our app file and replace that content view that we just deleted with our new home view. Okay, so that looks pretty good. Um, what we're gonna do is go ahead and just resume our preview to make sure everything is showing up correctly. I'm actually gonna select an iPhone 13 from the list of simulators. Go ahead and hit resume, and let's see if that comes up and our project builds successfully, it should. And then the first thing we're gonna do to get started, guys, is get this nice little live prices um, navigation title up at the top. So this is a navigation view. You'll notice that if I scroll up, we have that really smooth transition between the, lar between the large title and the inline title. So let's go ahead and start by doing that. So to get started, we are gonna first 
create a navigation view. And then we are gonna notice that this is one giant sort of scroll view, guys. So that's the next thing we're gonna create. We're gonna just say scroll view. And we wanna say, let's go ahead and select that first option with axis shows indicator and content. The axis is going to be dot vertical, shows indicators is going to be false. And then you can hit enter on the content block and it'll just expand it for you, which is nice. Right, so we need to actually like place um, some stuff inside of the scroll view, but first let's go ahead and get the navigation title. So at the after the scroll view bracket, just go ahead and say navigation title, live prices. And that looks pretty good, right? I don't think this error is actually, yeah, so you notice it goes away. So this is um, a great starting point. Now what I want us to do is just get an outline of our UI with some comments in the code really quick. So the first thing we're gonna build is this top movers view, and then we're gonna add this all coins view. So let's just go here and say top movers view, and then all coins view. So now that we have that really simple outline of what our user interface is gonna look like, let's go ahead and get started with building this top movers view that we see here up at the top. So to get started guys, we're gonna go back to our home folder and go to the views folder once again, and we are gonna create two new files here. So Swift UI view, and this is going to be top movers view. And then we're gonna create one more, and it's gonna be called top movers item view. So the basic structure behind this is that this top movers view is gonna be this view that you see here. And as the naming suggests, this top movers item view is gonna be each item that we have. And then we are gonna place each one of these items a certain amount of times in the parent view that we're gonna call it, which is the top movers view. So we're gonna start off with this item view here. So um, let's talk a little bit about what exactly it is before we start building it. I always like to sort of outline how I'm gonna build my Swift UI view before I get started, because it actually helps save you a lot of time. So it's actually just gonna be a V stack, right? Each one of these uh, items that we see here is just in a vertical stack. And we're gonna give that V stack a frame and a border, right? It's actually gonna be pretty simple so we're gonna start with the image, and then this here is actually an H stack, right? It's the coin name and the coin price, and then this is just gonna be the amount that that coin has moved in the last 24 hours. And eventually we're gonna organize this so that it uh, shows the top moving coin first and uh, goes down the list right there. So, and actually got just noticed a little bug that I have to fix where some of these are actually in the negative, right? So we're gonna account for that as well. So let's go ahead and get started with this. So we said we wanted a V stack. So we're gonna have an image, then we're gonna have coin info, and then we are gonna have coin percent change right there. So to start with the image, we're gonna say image system name, and we actually get like a, a cool Bitcoin image from Xcode. So that's what this whole system name thing is about. So we can go and say Bitcoin sign dot circle dot fill. And let's just go ahead and resume our preview once again. And we'll see that little Bitcoin guy showing up right there. So let's actually just go ahead and resize our image, guys. So we're going to say dot resizable. And then it's going to get huge. We're going to say dot frame uh, 32 by 32, I believe is what we want. And we'll notice that that looks like much better. And then we can actually go ahead and give this a tint color. So we can say foreground color dot orange. And that's gonna make it look like really similar to the actual Bitcoin logo, which is pretty cool. All right, now this coin info. So this is actually gonna be a horizontal stack, right? We're gonna have this one bolded text, which represents the coin name. And then this guy, which represents the coin price. So we're gonna create an H stack here. And we're gonna say uh, text. And let's just go say BTC. And it's gonna be dot font dot caption dot font weight is dot bold. And that should be good. And then we need a text with the coin's current price. So I'm just gonna mirror this that we see right here, which is $20,330. So dollar sign 2330.00. 0. 
And then that's going to be a font of dot caption as well with the foreground color of dot gray. So that looks pretty good. Um, next up, we just have to do the coin percentage change. So let's go ahead here and we're going to say text. And for now, we're just going to do the plus sign. We will actually implement the logic to show, you know, plus or minus and actually change if it's minus, we'll change the foreground color of it to red to indicate that it is actually down. Um, but right now we're just going to have plus and then we're going to add. Uh, oh, sorry. We're just going to now say, what is it uh, like? 5.6%. So let's pre pretend that Bitcoin is actually up today, which would be nice. Um, but it is not. But this is just for, you know, building our UI. So we're going to say dot font is title two and then dot foreground color is dot green. Right. OK, so you guys will notice that there's a couple more things we need. We need to get the border and we also want to align all of this stuff or these view components to the leading edge of this frame. Right. So I see my frame here of this V stack. I want to get everything over to the left. So we're going to say alignment. Dot leading right there. And that looks really good. And we're also going to give it some spacing. So let's go, let's go ahead and say spacing and just do four pixels. And that also looks pretty good. Actually, I don't know if I like that. Let's just remove that. I think that looks a little bit better. And now what we're going to do is um, go ahead and give it a frame. So we're going to go down to the bottom of our V stack and say frame. And it's going to be 140 by 140. And you'll now see that the frame of the V stack has expanded. Now all that's left to do is give it a nice rounded border. So we're going to say dot overlay. Just delete that. And we're going to give it a rounded rectangle with a corner radius of 10. And now we're going to give it a stroke of color parentheses dot system gray four. And then we're going to make the line width two or sorry, um, that's actually three. And that's a little too thick for my liking. Um, so I actually prefer to give it two on the line width. You could even go ahead, go as far to give it one um, pixel on the line width if you want that super thin look. Um, I think two is a nice balance. Um, but yeah, guys, that is actually looking pretty good. So let's go ahead and uh, just move on. Um, I, I, something about the spacing seems off to me, actually. So let's go ahead and see if we can um, give some of this some padding. Yeah. So right here, I want a little bit more space between um, the picture and the H stack right there. So on the image, I'm going to give it a, bad, a bottom padding of eight pixels. And that looks a lot cleaner. And I also want this to be a little bit closer together. So on our coin info H stack, let's just go ahead and say spacing is two, right? Okay, so that looks pretty clean. And um, we are gonna now go and use this item view multiple times in our top movers view, right? So this is gonna be um, a vertical stack, right? So it's the section title, is going to be above all of this like scrollable horizontal list of our top movers item views. So let's go ahead and start by creating our V stack in our top movers view. And we're going to say text top movers dot font of dot headline. And let's go ahead and just resume our preview to see how that looks. One more time. And that looks pretty good to me. Now we are going to create a scroll view and it's going to be an H stack and we're going to say for each and just select that first option with data and content. So our data, let's just go zero up to five and hit enter on that content block. Right now we don't need um, a, like a variable name in our closure because we're just doing a static loop through these uh, indices or this range of numbers. 
and we don't really need anything about these numbers in um, inside of our top movers item view. Eventually, we're going to change this up and populate each one of these things with a coin, um, but that comes later. So we need to say id backslash self. Anytime you create views in Swift UI with a for each loop, each view needs its own individual ID or unique identifier. So now we're gonna just go ahead and drop our top movers item view in here, right? So we can see that showing up pretty nicely. Um, we are gonna to wanna to change this up a little bit, however. We are gonna want our top movers view or section title to be on the leading edge. So to do that, go to your VStack and give it an, a leading alignment. And that is looking a little weird. It's like expanding off the screen. Um, so let's maybe change this to say dot horizontal. And yes, that actually fixes it, right? So now it's recognizing it as a horizontal scroll view and um, everything is fitting on the screen properly now. And we just need to give it some padding. So on this entire V stack, guys, just go ahead and give it some padding. And that looks pretty good. And I do want a little bit more spacing between my items here. So let's just go ahead and say spacing and maybe give it eight pixels of space between each guy, maybe 12 actually, um, maybe even 16. Yeah, I like 16. Um, it shows just enough of the preview of the next item to indicate to the user that this is a scrollable list, which is a really, um, really great UI trick to use in your apps just to help with the user experience. If, we, if this were completely out of view, the user might not know that this is actually a scrollable list. So keeping that partial view there is actually pretty important when it comes to building quality user interfaces. So now the last piece of the puzzle here at least for the user interface side of things, is to drop this top movers view back inside of our home view. So we know exactly where we need it to go thanks to our outline. And we're just gonna go here and say top movers view, just like that. And you guys notice that boom, it just drags and drops right in there. And the app is already starting to come together with this super clean user interface that we have here. Um, for this awesome cryptocurrency app that we're building. So that's gonna wrap it up for this module. And the next one, we are gonna get started with building the user interfo interface for this all coins list that we see right here. So get excited for that, guys. We will see you there. So in this module, we are gonna be building our all coins list that we see right here. And it's just the user interface. We're gonna to get to the API and all the actual data a little bit later. Before we get into that, however, I do want us to go ahead and add this divider that we see here. So let's just go ahead and say divider. And you guys will notice that a nice divider shows up right there, indicating that this is like a section item. And then below that, we are gonna place our all coins view. So once again, we're gonna create two more files. We're gonna create the overall like sort of container view for all of this. And then we're gonna create a separate view for each one of our coin row views or coin cells, whatever you like to call it. So back in our views folder, we're gonna just create two more Swift UI views. So I'm gonna call this all coins view. And then create another view. And this one, I'm going to call it coin row view. Um, another common naming convention you'll see is coin cell. Um, whichever one you like. So we're gonna get started back in our all coins view. So let's just go ahead and hit resume and get started with building our UI. So we need our title right here, very similar to what we had in our previous view. So we're just gonna say text all coins dot font of dot headline. That looks good. And then let's go ahead and create this like sort of uh, label uh, view for that's going to help the user um, kind of distinguish what's going on with this big list of items, right? These are coins and these are prices. Um, eventually, what you guys could do is add like make these buttons and allow users to filter uh, have like filtering options, right? Where they could filter by lowest price or highest price or biggest price change, whatever. So that's where those uh, that's another purpose those uh, labels could serve there. 
So really quickly, let's make an H stack. And we're gonna say text, ooh, huh. scratch that guy, sorry. We actually need to wrap this all inside of a V stack. So let's go ahead and hit Command X there and create a V stack, paste that back in, and then create our H stack. So let's see, uh, we want text that says all coins. Oh, sorry, not all coins, uh, just coin. And then we want a spacer and then we want a text that says prices, right? So that's how we spread everything out there using that spacer. And then we're gonna wanna go ahead and give this some horizontal padding and a different font and color for each one of those text items. So instead of placing like dot font of dot caption on each one of these, like you would have to do like that, you can actually just say dot font of dot caption on the entire H stack and we'll have the exact same effect. And it saves you um, a little bit of, um, it makes your code a little bit more concise there. So we see we get the exact same effect by just placing the font of caption on the entire H stack. Same thing with the foreground color. We can just say dot gray. And then we're gonna give it a padding of dot horizontal. All right, so that looks pretty good. And then next up is the fun part where we are going to get started with creating this coin row view that we see here. So let's hop into our coin row view and get started. So this is actually gonna be one big H stack, guys. So the first item is gonna be that number and then we're gonna have our image, a V stack of the coin information and then a V stack of the coin price. So let's go ahead and just create an outline for this. So we need an H stack. We're gonna say ID number, or I believe it's actually the market cap rank. Yeah, so market cap rank um, image, coin name info, and coin price info, right? So this just once again helps us organize the outline of our UI. So for our uh, market cap rank, this is gonna be pretty simple. It's just text and we can say one dot font of dot caption dot uh, foreground color is dot gray. And let's just go ahead and actually hit resume so we can see what our coin row view is starting to look like. All right, so it's just a little one right there. Good start. Next up, we're gonna create an image system name Bitcoin sign dot circle dot fill dot resizable. And then we're gonna say dot scale to fit just to make sure we get the right aspect ratio. And then we're gonna give it a frame of 32 by 32. Just like that. And then foreground color of dot orange for now. We're gonna remove that later on because obviously all of these images are gonna have their own like colors and all that cool stuff. This is just to, you know, make our preview look a little bit cooler. Right, so that's good. Now we need the coin name info, and this is gonna be a V stack. And let's just go ahead and start it off by giving it an alignment of dot leading and some spacing of four. Right, so we do want this to be aligned to the leading edge as we see here. That's how we get why we, um, modify the alignment of our VStack. So let's go ahead and say text Bitcoin dot font of dot sub headline dot font weight dot semi bold dot padding. We're gonna actually give this a leading padding of four pixels. And then the foreground color looks good to me. And now below that, we're gonna say text BTC dot font of dot caption And we're actually gonna give this a padding of dot leading and six pixels. So you guys might be asking, hey, why not give it four and four? And that's because this, uh, this makes it line up just a little bit better, right? Because this font size is so much smaller. So that extra padding accounts for that extra space. You were to notice that we gave it only four pixels of padding. It doesn't really line up uniformly with um, our Bitcoin label. So just go ahead and give it six pixels of padding. It's the little things, guys, that make your UI super, super clean. Um, 
And to me, that foreground color looks good. Um, and then we're gonna go ahead and just give this a little bit more padding overall of two. All right, so that looks pretty good. And then um, we need a spacer here, right? Because we want this pushed all the way to the left and then we want the price stuff on the right. So go ahead and add a spacer. It's gonna push it all the way over. And then we're pretty much just gonna grab like this same exact V stack and just paste it in. And instead of the alignment being leading, we're gonna make it trailing. Spacing of four is fine. And we are gonna make this like an actual price. So we're gonna say 20K comma 330.00. That looks pretty good. And then this is gonna be like minus 5.60%. And then for the foreground color there, we can go ahead and make it red just so you guys can see what that's going to look like. You know, that looks pretty good. Um, so we are going to want to give this some padding on the horizontal edges, right? Because we want some padding this way and some padding this way. So on our overall H stack, right? So that's going to be that bracket right there. Just go and say padding. We don't want that much padding, so we're just gonna say dot horizontal. All right, so that looks pretty good. And just to space things out nicely, you can give it a vertical padding of maybe like four pixels, right? Just to give it a little bit of wiggle room on the vertical edges as well and space things out once we put this in a big list a little nicer. So to continue on, we are now going to utilize this coin row view inside of our all coins view. So here we can just go ahead and make a for each loop. Actually, let's, we have to wrap this in a scroll view. So we're gonna say scroll view, V stack for each. Uh, data is gonna be like zero up to like 50 content. You can just do underscore in and then go ahead and add your ID backslash dot self. And then just go ahead and add your coin row view, guys. And now let's go ahead and resume this. And we notice that we have this awesome scrollable list of our coins. Um, it's just dummy data, obviously. If you guys want to actually like be able to scroll through this list, go ahead and just hit play on the preview simulator right there and you'll be able to scroll. And you guys notice that this acts as like kind of a header, which is cool. Um, uh, another interesting thing to note is um, we didn't actually have to place this in a scroll view, but uh, because you know our main view, once we go back here and put it here is already inside of a scroll view, but it's better to, in my opinion, because if you ever wanna utilize this view somewhere else that's not inside of a scroll view, you are gonna wanna make sure that you have it wrapped inside of a scroll view just like this. So um, really quickly, we need to, move this all coins guy over to the left. And to do that, we can just say alignment is dot leading on our V stack. And that looks good. And let's just go ahead and give that some padding. Um, we've taken care of all the padding for our cells already. So we don't need to add any more padding to the overall V stack or each one of our coin row views. Now to really wrap this up and put the icing on the cake, let's go back to our home view and just drop in that all coins view, right? and hit resume and now we can see that our app ui or user interface has really really come together nicely right and our home view isn't messy it's super super clean we just extracted these views into separate classes um, or files and that makes it so that our home view is really nice and neat um, and everything is really organized nicely and the ui looks super super clean so that's really gonna wrap it up for our user interface, guys. Um, we are gonna add dark mode support later on. Let me, go, let me go ahead and show you guys what that looks like. It's pretty awesome. So in my simulator, I'm gonna go to features and then say toggle appearance. So this has full dark mode support, which is gonna be really, really cool. Um, so we're gonna be doing that as well, but that will come later towards the end of this uh, tutorial. Uh, next up, we are going to be getting started with how to implement our networking layer, our view models, and our data models. So that's gonna be really exciting, guys. 
let's go ahead and now get into the next module of the of the tutorial. What's going on guys, welcome back. In this module, we're gonna be taking a look at our API or where we're gonna be getting all of our data from. And we're also gonna talk about how we're gonna get it, start writing some code to implement our networking layer, which is how we're gonna communicate with our API and all that fun stuff. So let's get started by taking a look at the API. So really quickly guys, open up an internet browser. And before we get into that, I wanna make sure you guys check out my website at stephancodes.com where I have access to a ton of professional level courses, uh, subscription plans that give you guys access to discounts, private coaching of all my site products, as well as just a bunch of awesome source code templates if you guys want these uh, to help you get started with building an application or for learning purposes or whatever it may be. So make sure you check out my website at stephancodes.com. Thanks guys. So let's head back over to Google and actually take a look at our API. So we are going to Google CoinGecko one word and API. And then just go ahead and click on the first link that you see and this is the page that you should be taken to. So we are then gonna click on explore documentation. So this is obviously the API that we're gonna be using. It's an awesome API that gives us access to real time cryptocurrency data. And they have this really cool interface here that allows us to explore different API endpoints that all contain different sets of data um, about coins and markets and things like that. So scroll down to the coin section and we're gonna select this coin slash markets guy. And we're gonna select this try it out button. And basically we're gonna fill in some parameters here guys. And it's gonna allow us to get a sample of JSON data back or essentially what the raw data that we're gonna be using in our application to make it look like this with real life cryptocurrency data is gonna look like. And it's gonna give us a request URL and all of that good stuff. So for the currency field, just type out USD and we don't need these two fields. We want market cap descending so we get the largest market cap first at the top of the list. We can do 100 coins, you can do 50, whatever you want. Uh, one page, and then we are gonna, we don't need this Sparkline seven days data, um, but for a different version of the application um, where we actually build some charts, you would want this data. So we can actually just go ahead and select it to true. And then we want a price change percentage. So I'm actually gonna go ahead and say 24 hours. And that's what this guy represents. It'll give us the price change percentage in the last 24 hours. That's how we get this cool uh, Delta data. So go ahead and hit execute. And it's gonna take a second, but what we're gonna get back is a gigantic list of a bunch of different cryptocurrency coins. And you're gonna notice that it mirrors what we have in our all coins list exactly. So here's that handy request URL that we're gonna need in order to communicate with this API and actually get this data back. And then you guys see here that this is a bunch of JSON data that represents information about each coin. So this is obviously Bitcoin. We see the symbol is BTC, so that's where we get this information. Uh, this is the image or the URL for the image, which is where we get that image right there. And then it has a bunch of other stuff um, but we don't really need to get into that right now. Let's just scroll down the list and see what the next item looks like. So you'll see Ethereum if you scroll down long enough. And that's exactly what we see in our list there. So you guys can see where we get the data from and how it works. So now that we've taken a look at the API, let's go ahead and just copy and paste this request URL and hang on to it for a bit. And we're gonna go back into our code and we're gonna create a view model for our home view. So we're gonna say command N to create a new file, Swift UI view, home view model. So this view model is going to be, uh, we actually don't want it to be a Swift UI view. Um, leave the import Swift UI and just say class home view model. Make it conform to the observable object type alias, just like that. Okay, so this home view model, like I was explaining before, is going to be responsible for communicating with the API, downloading all that coin data, and then updating our UI or main view. So let's go ahead and just write a function and write the code that we need to to communicate with our API and download that data. So I'm gonna say func fetch coin data. And we need that URL string now, right? So this request URL is what we're going to utilize with a URL session 
that is going to allow us to download all of this data that we get back from this response body. So this is our request. Once we make that request, it'll give us this as a response, and then we're gonna use all this data to ultimately display it in our application. So we're gonna say let URL string, and it's a pretty long string. Sorry, make sure you add your quotes because we have to represent this as a string first, and then we're gonna create a URL object from it. So we're gonna now say guard let URL equal capital URL, and select this string initializer, and we're just gonna pass in that URL string and say else return. So this converts it into an actual URL object. And now we're gonna go down here and say URL session dot shared dot data task, right? So if you guys have never used this before, really quickly, it's just some native code or frameworks that we get from Swift that we have for communicating with uh, the internet essentially, right? We can make a request to our URL and then download all the data that that request gives us back from that particular URL. So you see creates a task that retrieves the contents of a URL based on the specified URL request object and calls a handler upon completion. So that's exactly what we want. Actually, we want this uh, URL guy, not the URL request. So go ahead and pass in this URL we just created. Tab over by hitting tab to this uh, completion handler and hit enter, right? So we're gonna say data, response, and error. So these are all the things that we get back from the URL request. We get some potential data, a potential response, and, so, and then a potential error. So let's go ahead and just uh, handle our error really quickly. We're gonna say if let error equals error, print debug error and then just say error dot localized description. I always add debug in front of my print statements guys so that you can filter through all the console data which can get really heavy sometimes. And then this is just gonna print out whatever the error, potential error is we get back from this data task. So then we're actually gonna say return because if there is an error, we want this function to stop here and that's what that return statement is gonna do. Now, we're gonna say guard let data equal data else return. So this just makes sure we actually get some data back. And if we don't, once again, we'll just stop the function here. So before we go any forward, I wanna actually add a print statement to check the response that we get back from this URL. And then we'll see if we can print out some of the data as well. So before that guard statement, we're gonna just say, um, print debug response code. And we're just gonna leave this blank for now. We're, let's go over how to get a response code. So we're gonna say um, if let response equals response as HTTP URL response, then let's go ahead and grab this line of code and we're gonna go here and say print response dot status code, okay? So this is just gonna to indicate to us whether or not we are getting a successful response from our API. So if we go back to it, you can see that the status code here was 200. Um, anything in the 200s means it was a success. Anything over 200 where you get into threes or like the 404s, 405s, those mean that you got some sort of error or did not get a response back. So let's print out the response code. And then here, we're gonna say guard let data equals data. Let's just go ahead and say print debug data is data, right? So this will give us back some information about what we're getting back from our URL, which is great. Let's go ahead and write an initializer here and call this function, fetch coin data. So what this means, guys, is when we initialize this view model, um, it's gonna call this function and then do all this good stuff for us. Um, so now the question becomes, where do we implement this home view model? Well, you might've guessed that we're gonna do it back in the home view. So at the top, we're gonna create something called a state object var view model equals home view model. And we will get into why this is a state object, a little bit about what a state object and an observable object is. Um, if you guys are confused about that and have no idea what I'm talking about, 
Make sure you just go ahead and check out my YouTube Swift UI bootcamp. The link for that is in the description. I cover all this stuff in detail um, and just the overall foundations and basics of Swift UI all the way to the advanced stuff like we're doing here. So check that out if you're confused. But basically what this means is we can, we've now initialized our home view model and it's a state object. So if you guys remember what I said, when we initialize it, this is what happens. That's what init means. Uh, it's gonna fetch our coin data. So let's go ahead and run our project and see what we get back. This is exciting, right? So this is where this debug guy comes in handy. So I'm gonna add my filter there. Ooh, it doesn't look like we're getting anything back. That makes no sense. Oh, you know why? Because I forgot to add something. So back in your view model, Go ahead and click on the closure bracket. Go to the end of that and say dot resume. So this resumes the task if it is suspended. For some reason, Swift makes us add that resume function or iOS coding in general. It's the same with Objective-C. It's part of this URL session dot shared functionality. We have to hit uh, use this resume guy or this URL session will not work. So now let's go ahead and run our code again and see what we get back. Oh, look at that. That's pretty sweet, right? Our response code is 200, which means we're getting some data back. And we got back exactly 40,000 or 404,884 bytes of data, right? So what we need to do is actually do something with this data uh, because we need it in like a readable format. So let's go ahead and see if we can uh, maybe print this out as a string before we end this video because, um, you know, that's the main like meat and potatoes of this module was to just be able to communicate with our API. But let's see if we can get to the good stuff. So let's say let data as string equal string initializer. And we're going to pass this data in. And then the encoding is going to be dot UTF eight. And then let's go and see if we can print this data as a string now. So it should be just a massive amount of raw data. And look at that, guys, that's exactly what we get back. Um, we can see here that if we let's scroll like all the way up to the top, it's going to be a lot of data, but you know, see, we have an image, current price, all that stuff. So this is actual real live coin data that we're getting back from this API, which is really, really cool. The next step of this process is to go over how to get all this raw data organized into something called a data model or an object. And then utilize that object or data model that we create to display all of this information in this uh, cool layout that we have here so that it actually looks like this. You know, let me toggle this back to light mode. Toggle appearance, cool, right? Right, so that's gonna wrap it up for this module, guys. In the next one, we're gonna get started with our data model. So get excited for that, we'll see you there. What's going on guys, welcome back. In this module, we're gonna be creating our data model so that we can use it to populate our user interface. Uh, so basically, it's just gonna make working with all of this raw data way easier if we wrap this inside of a data object, which we're gonna do here in just a second. So let's go into our model folder and we're gonna create a Swift file. And this is gonna be our data object. It's just gonna be called a coin. So. You guys can imagine that making sense of all this raw data and actually building a data model is going to be kind of frustrating. Like, right, um, we got to, you know, create properties for all these and then make sure we parse all the JSON correctly. Luckily, there is a service online that does all that hard work for you. All you need to do is paste in a JSON body. So basically what we're going to do is scroll down this list or this response body up until you see the second coin, which is Ethereum, right? And then you're gonna go to that bracket right above it where you see that comma, and you're just gonna start, hold it and just drag it to highlight all this JSON data, right? And then you are gonna hit Command C to copy that or you know go to edit and copy, whatever. Okay, next, we're gonna use this uh, service called app.quicktype Dot io and you guys can see here i already have it up um let me just go ahead and delete the json data 
so that you can see what it looks like. So in this editor here, you're just gonna go ahead and paste all that JSON data in. But before you do that, you're gonna go ahead and select Swift as your language, make, make it a struct and not a class, and then toggle this option and this option only. Explicit coding key values in codable types. And if you guys look here, we literally have our entire data object with all the JSON parsing done for us, which is absolutely incredible. So we can just go ahead and copy that here. And that saves us a whole lot of time from typing all this junk out, right? So really quickly, let's change this to uh, coin, right? Because that's our data object. And once again, if you guys don't know what a struct or a data model or object is in coding in general, once again, please check out my YouTube Swift UI bootcamp where I go over this stuff in detail. So there's just a couple things we need to modify in order to get this to work, guys. Um, so we're actually gonna make a lot of these properties optional and we need to change the data types on them as well. So first off, delete ROI, we don't need that, and delete it from the coding keys as well. And then we're pretty much gonna go and make almost every single one of these properties optional. And that is because we're gonna be using the decodable protocol in order to decode all this stuff. And that's what you see these coding keys are for, right? Because the raw JSON data has underscores to separate words. And this is what we have to do to um, indicate to the decoder what, you know, uh, the coding key for something like current price is because you know, ideally your JSON would look like this, right? So it can just decode it directly and you wouldn't need all these coding keys, but that's not how it works all the time. So these coding keys just help us decode all that stuff. Um, but anyway, let's go ahead and see what we can do here. So um, we're always gonna have a current price, an image, an ID, a symbol, and a name. So none of those need to be optional, right? So after current price, go ahead and just delete that comma and actually create a new line and we're gonna say let right there, and we're gonna cast current price as a double. So these are non-optional, but everything else after that is going to be optional. And we have to change almost everything that's an integer to a double data type, because almost none of these things are integers, right? So change that to a double, optional. Um, price change 24 hours and price change percentage 24 hours are also gonna be non-optional. So just hit enter after that and say let. And these guys are gonna be doubles as well. Okay, and then market cap and all this stuff, optional, 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 and just keep going down the list. Cool. So the reason we have to make all those optional guys is because not all of this data gets sent back for every single coin. So sometimes it's gonna be there, sometimes it's not. And in order for our decodable protocol to work successfully, we need to make the things that might not be there optional, right? Because that's pretty much the definition of what it means to be optional. So now that we have our data model, let's go ahead and see if we can decode all of that raw data, that massive messy amount of JSON that we got back that looks super ugly and gross into this nice, beautiful data object that we just created, right? So let's go back to our home view model and we're gonna do stuff with this data. So we don't need these two lines of code anymore. If you guys wanna keep the stuff about the response, you could. Um, it might be good uh, to keep this if you wanna implement some error handling where you could check and do some logic saying like, hey, if the error, the status code is greater than 299, then show the user some sort of error message or maybe retry the API call, so on and so forth, right? So leave that there. And then this is obviously just some standard error handling. Um, we're gonna add a do statement here. And we are going to um, also add a catch statement. So say catch let error. And we'll go over this in a second. Um, but this is where we actually do our decoding. So we're gonna say let coins equal try JSON decoder dot decode array of coins dot self from the data. So it's gonna take all that data and turn it into this magically, right? That's absolutely dope. And now let's go ahead and say print debug 
coins, coins, right? So we'll see if we actually perform this decode successfully and if we get this print statement or not. Uh, let's see. So let's go ahead and add a, just a print statement. Print debug failed to decode with error and do some string interpolation, just pass in that error. Ooh, needs to be an array of coins dot self, just like that. Sorry about that, guys. So uh, we're trying to decode this into an array of coins and you just have to add this dot self after it. Not really sure why, you just do. Um, so now let's go ahead and run this again and see if that print statement changes up. Okay, so we this is why we handle our error, right? We have a good response code, so we know that we're actually getting data back. But you see here that we hit this catch statement. So this error is different than this error because this will be what happens if our decode fails, right? This is if something happens with the actual URL session. So let's see what the error is. Um, coding keys circulating supply is looks like it's still an integer, um, but you can see here that the value that it tried to decode was a double. So circulating supply, where are you? Uh, this guy right here, change that to a double, right? So that's a really good example of why logging your errors can be super, super helpful. Um, it lets you know exactly where to look and exactly what your error is, right? So don't always just be lazy and never handle your error. It does really help you out. But you guys can see here that we're actually getting back a giant list of coins, right? So it's not just raw data anymore. We see our app name dot coin. That means it's being successfully decoded into this object that we have here. So that's really going to wrap it up for this module. In the next one, it's all going to come together where we're going to be able to take this new array of data that we have with our data model and actually place it into our UI. So that's going to be super exciting, guys. Get excited for the next module. We'll see you there. Alrighty, guys. So we are going to start this off by hopping back into our view model. So basically, all of these this coin data is contained to our view model right now. So we need a way of getting this array of coins that we now have right into our user interface. So we're going to do that through use of a published variable. So we're going to say published var coins equals an array of coins, right? So we have this array of coins right down here. We can see that we decoded it into an array of coins. So these data types match up directly. So we can just go and instead of printing them out, we're going to say self.coins equals coins. So now because this is an observable object, once we um, now that we because we have this home view model inside of our home view, we are observing it through use of this state object, right? So when this object changes its state, we can listen for those changes and make updates to our user interface. So basically, we're going to be accessing this or using this view model to access all of that, all of those coins. But you notice that we have to do that in this all coins view. So that actually needs our view model as well. So uh, one way of doing this is just going into the all coins view and saying at state object var view model, home view model. But we're not actually going to initialize it, right? Um, why? That's because it's already been initialized once and we don't need to reinitialize it again. We can just pass the view model from place to place. And we're going to refactor this into something called an environment object a little bit later on. Just want to get this working for now. So you guys are going to notice that if I tried to build my project, it would fail. Um, it's actually failing in the preview. We don't really need that anymore. So let's try to build it again. And you can just comment out the preview code. And here's the actual error, right? We need to actually pass. Oh, did I put that in the coin row view? Yeah, that's my bad. Um, so guys, we don't want this on the coin row view. We want it on our all coins view, right? The What we're going to do with the coin row view comes in just a little bit, right? So now let's build. Once again, comment out the preview, build again, and our real error is going to come up. 
we have to pass this view model from here to here. So we've already initialized it once. Like I said, we don't do, we need to do it again. We can just hit fix here and pass our view model in. So now what we're gonna do is go back to our all coins view. And instead of looping through just this random range of indices or numbers, we're gonna say for each view model dot coins. And we can actually um, leave that as is. Right, so this actually, the coins guy has to conform to the identifiable protocol. Uh, basically means that it's gonna give each one of these coin row views its, un its own unique ID based on this coin data. So back in our models folder, just go here and say comma identifiable for our coin. And because it has an ID property, it automatically conforms to that identifiable protocol. And SwiftUI can now use that ID property to help it uh, create a unique identifier for each view. So we can actually go ahead and delete this right now. And then we are going to um, get access to each coin in our closure, right? So let's try to build this again. And you notice our build succeeds. So what we're gonna to wanna to do now is we have access to each individual coin through use of this for loop, right? We wanna pass that coin into our coin row view. So, oops, coin row view. We're gonna create an initializer of just a coin. And now we can use this coin to actually configure some of our data here. So, for example, um, I'm gonna replace this one with a, some string interpolation, say coin.market cap rank and give it a default value of just one, right? And then we can change our name guy. We can delete all those quotes to coin.name. So we can see how useful our data, mod, uh, data model is here because we just get this awesome dot notation and can access whatever we want through use of that um, and use it in our user interface, which makes it way easier than working with all that nasty raw data we had before. So here, we're gonna replace this with coin.symbol.uppercased, okay? And then here, we can replace this with coin.currentPrice, and this we can replace with coin.priceChangePercentage24 hours. And these numbers are gonna look really nasty, guys. Um, we're gonna add, we're gonna to have to add some number formatting a little bit later. Let's just go ahead and see if we did all of this stuff right. Ooh, our build failed. And that's because we actually need to pass this coin in here. Once again, I know I keep saying this, but if you're struggling with these concepts, make sure you just go ahead and check out my uh, SwiftUI YouTube bootcamp, guys. So like I said, the numbers look super ugly, right? And we don't have the image that we need just yet, but all of this other stuff is looking really good. So we have actual coin names and coin prices here, which is absolutely awesome. So we are really on the right track. We just need to modify how these numbers look through use of a number formatter. And we're gonna be creating an extension file to help us with all that stuff. Um, what I wanna do before we go to that next module of adding all the finishing touches and stuff, like the dark mode stuff we talked about, I want us to configure this top movers coin view with the uh, highest moving coins in terms of price change in the last 24 hours. So let's get started with that. Before we do get started with our top movers view, I do wanna do a brief run through of how exactly all of this worked, how exactly we went from fetching the data in the view model to getting it into our view, right? So uh, remember this is an observable object. So when things happen in this view model, for example, this coin array getting populated with data, we can listen for changes that happen on it, right? Back in our home view, because our home view has an instance of our view model and it's a state object, which is similar to an observed object. We're just observing that view model and listening for when things happen to it. So when that thing happens, uh, we pass that view model along to our all coins view when we create it. Back in our all coins view, this is where we need the coin data. So whenever that coins array gets published, it trickles down all the way into this all coins view and says, hey, I've been updated. You can now um, use this coins array uh, to populate your coin row view with coin data. 
right? So that's just a brief explanation of how that works. Um, but really quick, now let's get into our top movers view. So uh, you guys might've guessed, we need to do the same thing in terms of getting the view model into this view. So we're gonna say at state object var view model is home view model. And once again, you can comment out the preview or you could say view model, home view model if you want. You can initialize it here in the preview, that's fine. Um, if you guys wanna keep the preview, that's just how you uh, do that. We're basically requiring that this is this as an initialization parameter. So the preview is like, hey, in order to create this view, I need the initialization parameter you're telling me that it needs. So you notice we could hit resume and everything would still be working as expected. But what we need to do is now get the actual top moving coins, right? And we're gonna do that in the view model. And then instead of looping through zero to five here, we're gonna do a loop through the view models top moving coins and then populate each top movers item view with the correct coin. So let's go back to our home view model. And I'm gonna write a function here, guys, to configure. So this is uh, gonna say func configure top mover or moving coins. So I'm gonna say let top movers equal coins dot sorted by and just go ahead and do some opening and closing brackets just like that. You're gonna say dollar sign zero dot price change percentage 24 hours is greater than dollar sign one dot price change percentage 24 hours. And we actually need to create a, uh, an array for these top moving coins as well. So let's just go ahead and copy and paste that guy and we'll call this top coins or top uh, moving coins, I guess. And it's gonna be an array of coins as well. And here, we're just gonna, we're gonna be able to say uh, self dot top moving coins equals an array of top movers dot prefix of five. So basically guys, all this is doing is sorting the coins by their price change percentage in the last 24 hours. So at the top of that list will be the coin that changed the most in the last 24 hours. And then we're just getting the top uh, X amount of those coins. In this case, it's just five. You guys could make that 10 or whatever you wanted to really. Um, really quick guys, there's uh, something else we need to fix. Um, you guys notice we're getting this like purple error here. It says publishing changes from background threads is not allowed. Make sure to publish values from the main thread, okay? So all we have to do is inside of this guy right here, we can just cut out that statement that says self.coins equals coins, and we say dispatch dispatchq.main.async. So if you look at what this does, it schedules a block asynchronously for execution and optionally associates it with a dispatch group. That sounds like nonsense. Basically, all it does, it gets us back on the main thread so that we can say self.coins equals coins, and then we can call our function for self.configure top moving coins. So this is now also a published variable. So whenever this gets populated, we want our top movers view to be listening to that, which is why we implemented our view model here as well as a state object. So now instead of zero to five like this, we can say view model dot top moving coins and we can delete the ID of backslash dot self. And here we want to name this coin in our, um, in our block. And we wanna pass a coin into our top movers item view as well. So let's go here and exactly what we did in our coin row view, we want this to be populated with coin data. So now we can uh, make this uh, just, you know, fill out the data that we need using our coin that we have now. So. Here we say coin.symbol.uppercased, just like that. And then um, here we could, you know, also say coin.currentPrice. And here we could say coin.current uh, price change percent 24 hours, just like that. So now let's go ahead and, ooh, I don't, 
I thought I had that. Okay, yeah, we need a coin here. So we do not have uh, mock data for a coin, guys. So just go ahead and uh, comment out your preview there. And let's go ahead and run our project again. Oop, my build is failing. Let's see why. Okay, I actually have to pass that coin in. And then I have to pass the view model here as well in my home view. So this should now come out looking really, really good. Um, awesome, guys. So we see here that we are now uh, getting this top movers view configured successfully. Um, we just need to uh, implement the ability to download the correct coin image and then format all these numbers so it doesn't look so nasty, right? We want it to be nice and clean, just like we saw in our completed uh, application like this, right? So that's what we're gonna be working on next, guys. This is really like the finishing touches section of the app. Um, so, you know, we're almost done and it's really coming together. Hope you guys are enjoying this so far. Uh, stick around to finish this app up and really polish it off. Before we get started with this module, guys, I wanted to show you the premium version of this application I have that has a bunch of awesome additional features. So the source code for this is on sale on my website at stephancodes.com slash shop. And I also have a full professional level video tutorial course coming for the completed version of this application as well. Check the link in the description to this video to see if it's currently available. So really quickly, you're gonna have this awesome portfolio feature that allows you to keep track of all the coins you have. You also have the ability to make, buy, and sell transactions. And clicking on that coin will give you um, the information about it, like your net profit loss and your average buy price and a list of your transactions with transaction details. So um, that's just one of the many awesome features of this. We also see that we have the base version of our app that we're building inside of this as well. But another cool feature is the ability to like get a bunch of additional coin details with uh, a really cool like line chart of the coins price over time, the ability to add a transaction here, as we see there, uh, in addition to all the other stuff we're building, like full dark mode support. And you can see that this is really aesthetically pleasing. Um, so, and then you also have the ability to buy and sell coins through here and have them be added to your portfolio. So make sure you guys check this out as well if you really wanna take this app to the next level as well as your coding skills to the next level by building a more complex advanced application with Swift UI. So anyway, let's get back to our, um, our version of the application. Let me toggle my uh, appearance back to light mode and let's get started with what we need to do to download our uh, images. So in order to get started with downloading images for our coins, we're gonna install something called a Swift package ut utilizing the Kingfisher package to be exact in order to help us with downloading uh, these coin images for us. I really like Kingfisher. I personally think it's the best thing to use for Swift UI. So let's go to Google really quickly and just type in Kingfisher Swift package. And just click on this guy right here, one vcat slash Kingfisher and just do a command F on this page and type in uh, Swift package manager, right? So here we can see the link that we need to uh, actually download the Swift package. So let's go back to Xcode now, and we're gonna go to file and say add packages, and we're just gonna paste that URL right there, and you should see the Kingfisher package show up right there. Make sure it's https colon slash slash github.com slash one vcat slash kingfisher.git. And then we're gonna add our package and we're gonna let this do its thing. Okay, add package. And you guys will notice that we now have this package in here. So what this is, is a dependency injection. It's a bunch of code that somebody else has written that we can inject into our project that's gonna help us with downloading images and making our life super, super simple, right? So let's go back to our coin row view and we're gonna go up to the top and we're gonna import Kingfisher. And this is such a simple change, guys. Instead of having this image with just a system name that's hard coded, we're going to replace this with a KF image, open up our parentheses, and we need to pass in a URL. So we're just going to say URL string, and we're going to say coin.image. So this is the actual image URL for each individual coin. So now 
we're going to utilize that image URL to download the image data and display it in our coin row view. And we need to do the same thing in our top movers view. So in our top movers item view, do the same exact thing, import Kingfisher up at the top and replace this hard coded image with a KF image of the coin, oh sorry, URL string coin dot image. And let's go ahead our runner and run our project. And we're gonna notice that we have a bunch of uh, images showing up for each individual coin. And it's really gonna bring this to life and make our UI a lot more dynamic. And look how awesome that looks, guys. Um, we have this beautiful user interface really starting to come together. The last thing we need to do um, in order to really clean this up is implement some number formatting and then add dark mode support as well, which is gonna be really fun. So get excited for that, guys. That's what the next module is gonna be about. What's going on guys, welcome back. This module is gonna be all about making our app look nice and purdy, right? We want it looking real nice with those nice numbers and percentages and all that. So that's what we're gonna be doing in this module by creating some number formatters, all right? So we're gonna hop up. Uh, actually, really quick, let me show you what the completed app looks like one more time. This is the pro version that I talked about earlier. And you guys notice that all of our numbers are very nicely formatted. And as I said before, nice and purdy. So let's go ahead and go over what we need to do to make that happen in our application. So go up to your extensions file or folder and create a new file. So we're gonna call this double. So these are all of our extensions on the double data type, which is just a number that has decimals. So we're gonna say extension double, and we're gonna create some, uh, some number formatters here, okay? So I'm gonna say, you know, first off, private var currency formatter. And this is gonna have attributes and characteristics that are gonna help us format our currencies so that it turns like a number like this to only have two decimal places, the correct uh, currency sign and all that stuff. So this is gonna be a number formatter. And this is gonna say let formatter equal number formatter. Formatter dot uses grouping separator equals true. Formatter dot number style equals dot currency. And then formatter dot minimum number of digits minimum uh, minimum fraction why isn't that showing up i probably spelled it wrong minimum fraction digits equals two and formatter dot maximum fraction digits equals two so this guarantees that it will always have two numbers after um, all of my currency values and then we're just going to return our formatter and now what we're going to do guys is create a helper method to utilize this number formatter in order to help it format our prices. So let's go and create a function here called currency, or we can call it two currency with two decimals. Or, you know, you really just call it two currency. If you wanna get specific with the naming, you can, you can, but I think two currency is fine. So it's gonna return a string and we're gonna say let uh, we're just going to say return currency formatter dot string for number. Um, and we're going to actually say self right there. And we're going to give it a default value of zero or a string of, uh, oops, man, I'm all over the place right now. Sorry, guys. 0, 0.00, just like that. All right. So let's just go ahead and hit command B to build our project. And everything works just fine. So now we're gonna be able to go ahead and use this extension right here that we just created, this function, on any double value that we have in the application. So we're just gonna go convert it to a currency really quick. So let's start out by going to the coin row view and doing that right here. So I'm gonna go coin row view and let's see, where is that guy? Coin.currentPrice and then we can just go here and say dot two currency. How cool is that, right? Because we wrote this as an extension on the double data type in our coin.currentPrice, if we hold down command and click into that, we notice that that's a double. So anytime we have a double value, we can just say dot two currency, and that's gonna give us back the, the correct string value that's all nice and formatted. And we can also 
go ahead and just delete all of those uh, the string interpolation stuff because this is going to return a string for us, which is really nice. So let's go ahead and run our application again, guys, just to see if this is looking nice for us. And look at that. That's looking absolutely beautiful. Now the only other place we need to do that is our top movers view. And then we're going to move on to the percentages. Okay, so go to your top movers item view. And when we're going to go here, uh, coin.currentprice.toCurrency. And once again, delete all your string interpolation stuff. Run the application, uno mas tiempo. And bam, those currencies are all showing up nicely as well. And this app is really starting to come together and it's really starting to look slick. So now let's go and move on to our percentages, guys. So let's hop back into this double extension. And let's see. Um, we need to create a percent formatter. So in order to do that, I'm actually going to create a different uh, formatter object to help me do that. So I'm going to call this let number formatter. And we're actually just going to make it a number formatter, guys, and uh, write some code to make it work with the percentages. And we're also going to be using it to make sure that this only displays like a single numeric value. So let's say number formatter. And then we can pretty much just copy all this code and just modify a couple things. So number style is actually just going to be decimal. And we don't need this using grouping, uh, uses grouping separator. And then we want the minimum and maximum fraction digits to be the same. Um, let's see. Oh, I think we need to say private var. Yeah. Okay. So that's looking pretty good. Now um, let's write another function here. We could maybe call it 2%. And I'm actually going to say string. That gives that makes the naming a little bit more clear. And here we can just say return number formatter dot string for self plus a percent sign. Okay. So Guys, if you're confused by what the self is referencing, it's referencing whatever double value that we're looking at, right? So because this is an extension of a double uh, like data type, self just rep, uh, uh, refers to what the data type is. So essentially, this is going to return a number formatter on whatever double value we're applying this, num this function to. Um, and then here we also need a uh, default value. So let's say this 0.00% uh, .00%, just to give it a default value. Now um, we can go ahead and use this 2% string function back in our coin row view and our top movers view. So let's start with our top movers item view. And here we're just going to say 2% string. And once again, delete all your string interpolation. And let's just go ahead and copy that text line because it's going to be the same thing here and go to coin row view and just paste that guy right there or just change that to what this says. And let's go ahead and run that. All right, so it looks like our build failed. Let's check out why. Um, it has to do with the return type here and, and how it's uh, optional and stuff. So let's actually go ahead and do this. We're gonna say guard let um, number equal number or number as string equal number formatter dot string from self. And we're gonna say else return nothing, just a blank string. And then here we'll say return number as string plus a percent sign, just like that. And let's go ahead and run our app now. Ooh. Oh, this needs to be for, not from. So make sure it's string for self, not string from self. Okay, and look at that, guys. That's looking absolutely incredible. Um, the only thing left we need to do um, before we actually do this guy as well, where we just change this to be a single numeric value instead of this one point blah, 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 um, is actually uh, implement whether this text should be red or green based on whether or not it's a positive or negative value. 
So in order to do that, guys, we are going to hop back into um, our coin row view, or let's do our top mover item view, actually. And we're just going to implement some logic to help us calculate the foreground color of this text label that we see here. So it's going to be pretty simple. Just go ahead and delete that. And we're going to say coin dot price change percent 24 hours is greater than zero. Yes, we want it to be green. No, we want it to be red. So that's all we have to do. We're just saying, hey, if the price range percentage is greater than zero, make the foreground color of this text green. If it's not, make it red. So this is an example of a ternary statement and you're gonna see these a lot in SwiftUI if you haven't already. So let's go ahead and do the same thing for our coin row view. So basically guys, we uh, just need to um, copy and paste that line of code in there. Uh, coin row view. And we're gonna go here and say, bam. And let's go ahead and run it. So look at how awesome that looks now, right? So obviously these haven't changed because these are all positive values. But if, if you look at our coin row views, you can see that the coins that are down, like Ethereum is currently down 11.1%. It's a red uh, value. And we also see our percentage there looking really, really nice. So that's uh, really going to help us clean this up a lot, guys. The last piece of the puzzle here before we get on to uh, the dark mode support is going to be converting this guy to a single numeric digit. And we can actually get a little bit cheeky with this, right, where we don't actually need to use our number formatter. We can actually just go and see if we can convert this guy into an integer, right? Nice little trick I'm about to show you guys. So let's actually hop back into our model file. So we can see that our market cap rank is currently being represented as a double, right? So what we can do is take this guy and just turn it into an integer. So I can go here and say, let market cap rank be an int and just delete that from there, just like that. And that is all we're gonna have to do. I'm pretty sure we're always gonna have a market cap rank because you know all of these coins are ranked in their market cap somewhere. So I don't think we need to make that optional. Um, let's go ahead and run our project to see if this works. Build succeeded. And you guys notice that that solves our problem beautifully there, right? So we didn't have to go through the hassle of using like a number formatter there. We just uh, represented this guy as an integer because this will this should never come back as a double, right? It's just a single ranking value. So that looks really good, guys. Uh, that's going to wrap it up for this module. The next one, we're going to be creating some different color schemes and going over how to make our UI even more dynamic with dark mode support. So in this module, guys, we're going to be adding dark mode support. Uh, if you've tried it out already, you'll notice that the app looks pretty darn good as is with the current setup. Um, like that looks pretty good, right? Like all the text changes color for us, the background changes color for us. And that looks awesome. Um, we can make it look a little bit better, in my opinion. And I also just want to show you guys how to implement dark mode support in general so that you have that in your toolbox for the future and you can customize any app you want with light and dark mode support. So we're going to hop into the, uh, to our assets folder and we are going to create a new color set. And I'm going to call this item background color. And it's going to be for this item view that we see right here. Um, and it's going to be really, really slight, right? Uh, the only reason I want to change this is because this is the exact same background as our uh, main background. And we could give it like a really slight background color to just kind of make it stand out a little bit more from the background. It does have this nice outline, which is good, but we can take this a step further to really clean our user interface up and make it look even more sleek. So for this any appearance guy, what we're gonna do is say show color panel, and we're actually gonna give this like a black color, and we're only gonna give it 2% opacity. Okay, so it's gonna be this really, really, really light shade of black for when we're in light mode that gives it a really nice like gray back, grayish background color. And then for dark mode, we're, we wanna do the same thing, but with a white color, right? So we'll make it like snow white, just like that. 
and you're actually gonna give this a 7% opacity right there. And let's go ahead and uh, see how we're gonna implement this. So back inside of our top mover item view, right after this frame declaration, where we set the frame before we set the overlay, you're just gonna say dot background is color and it's gonna be item background color inside quotes. Let's go ahead and run this and see what it looks like. And you guys are gonna notice that this is actually responsive. So it makes, um, it's gonna change the background color based on whether or not the app is in light mode or dark mode. So you can see here that it just makes these items stand out a little bit more. Um, you guys might like that, you might not. Um, some of you might like the flat black look, uh, but some of you guys might like this a little bit better. Let's go ahead and toggle our appearance. And we can see that um, in the white or the light mode, it actually has like this super, super light um, white or sorry, like black color that gives it like just that little bit more dimension to really make the item view sort of pop out. Um, I didn't really like the 7% opacity, so I'm actually gonna lower it to like five. So we can do that here as well. And let's run that again. And guys, if you, uh, I don't know if I explained this, but in order to get this, you just toggle this little right hand menu up at the top or that toggle button right there. So let's change this back to dark mode and see if it looks any better. Toggle appearance. And yeah, to me that looks just a little bit more subtle, but you can still tell that it's a different color than the actual background color there. So that is how you implement dark mode support. You guys can now take this a step further if you like and implement some more dark mode colors. But like I said, I think this looks pretty good as is. Uh, this is very important to know how to do guys because dark mode is here to stay and a lot of people use dark mode on their phones. They switch back and forth between light and dark mode. So when you're building apps, that's something you definitely need to keep in mind. And that's gonna wrap it up for this YouTube tutorial, guys. Hope you learned a lot and enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you check out the links in the description to this video for the source code to everything that we just built, links to the upgraded version of this application if you wanna keep it going, and other helpful links to other courses and resources that I have on my channel and on my website. Make sure you guys also like and subscribe if you like this content and wanna see more of it coming. Drop a comment about what you thought about this video and maybe some other pieces of content that you'd like to see me make on the channel. Thanks for watching, guys. This is Stefan saying peace out.